Howdy. This is Dr. John back again for another Tuesday afternoon Q&A session and uh, got some great questions. So I'm going to leap right into those in a moment. And I want to remind you, we'd love to get your questions anytime you want to send them in. I'll try to get to all of them. In fact, I think after today we're caught up. Um, I really worked at it to get caught up. Now, if you do a call in or a chat in during the presentation, you're probably going to get just as thorough an explanation because these are topics that I deal with every day uh, or every week at least. And so mostly what you're going to be getting is my opinions and a lot of it's backed by science, uh, some research, but essentially, you know, it's my medical opinion. Now, if you call in or if you send the questions in earlier, I can prepare a few slides for you, which sometimes helps kind of get through everything if we have a little visual. And so today we've got some visuals. And um, I'm going to start out. The first question was, I've been basic, basically, I've been doing the liver flush and my sleep schedule is off. I'm not sleeping as much as usual. Now, in a minute, I'm going to have the actual question, but I'm going to start you off with a little presentation on the liver. Now, we just finished our liver flush program, which was crazy, crazy, wild, uh, successful. I mean, every time we do it, I'm kind of blown away. So here I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk a little bit about an email that Catherine sent out this morning about the liver. Maybe. Hmm. Not seeing it. Well, I'm going to come back to that then because I'm not finding for some reason that that is open on my screen. I think it got overridden here by one of these things. So. Yeah, it's probably in there. So I'm just going to go to the Q&A session. So the questions, we well, had five that I'm going to cover. And again, these are recorded. If there are some things that just boil the heck out of you, turn it off. And, you know, you can always come back and, and catch the ones that you are interested at a uh, later date on our site. And so we are on, Catherine, where do they go to find this? Uh, the balancing point dot net, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Wow. All those things that I don't use. That's so cool. All right. So here we go. Um, first question. There we are. I skipped over it. I'm currently doing the liver flush and I'm noticing my deep sleep isn't as long as it normally is. Why would that be? And of course, it all comes down to circadian rhythms. We are animals and we sometimes forget that. And all animals, all plants, every living thing on the earth is subject to rhythms and circadian rhythms. And so we have annual rhythms, we have monthly rhythms, we have daily rhythms. And so this is a melody, this is a circadian rhythm. Uh, chart and this is a western chart okay so here we can see at about eight nine o'clock melatonin secretion starts then you know within a half an hour to an hour we have enough of it that we can go to sleep two o'clock should be should be our deepest sleep if you have anxiety or if your liver's out of balance one to three a.m is when you would likely wake up Lowest body temperature, about 430. Sharpest blood pressure rises about 645. That's why we there are a lot of heart, that's heart attack time. People get out of bed and they're kind of rushing and their blood pressure naturally goes up. And that's a very dangerous time for some people. Melatonin then stops in the morning. And then around 10, we get our highest alertness. And that's why I recommend that people do their most important things, the most important work in the morning. And uh, I find for me that this is certainly true. The work that I do between 6 a.m. and noon is by far my most productive. However, in the afternoon, you have some of your best concentration times around 2.30. Not a bad time to watch a seminar or listen to a seminar. Um, 
And again, the more I align my body to these clocks, uh, the, the better I feel. 3.30, fastest reaction time. Five o'clock, greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength. Very interesting. Uh, and again, highest blood pressure around six, highest body temperature about seven in the evening. Now, as these stay in rhythm, this is what you'll find as they stay in balance. As they get out of balance, you'll see that you might get too hot at seven in the evening. You might get too cold at 4.30 in the morning. In fact, those are questions that we ask for Chinese medicine. Okay, here's another little um, clock. And this is looking at some different things slightly, um, as you can see, but the same basic idea. About 12.30 at night, your bowel movements get suppressed. That's why you don't have to get up every night and poop. All right. Another one, just, you know, just some different ways to look at it. Your urinary flow is highest in the early evening. Risk of stroke is highest between eight and nine. Right. And so you can just see these different things. Now, the point being. Uh oh. Where's that Chinese? Oh, here's the Chinese clock. So this clock is extremely accurate, and it shows that different organs have highest activity at certain times of the day. Chinese have had this for hundreds and hundreds of years. It is very consistent with the Western clocks, uh, except in the Western clocks, they don't attribute it to specific organs. So if the liver, for example, is out of balance, which it will be while you're doing a flush. You're flushing the liver. You're cleansing it. You're getting things to move. Um, you will change how your body breaks down and utilizes sugar. So you'll start out with your glucose. We call, you know, we call it a, fe a fed state after you've eaten. And it takes a few hours to burn off that sugar then the body will start burning glycogen from the liver. And glycogen is just really, really, really complex chains of sugar or glucose. <laughs> Sorry about that. We got some doggy action here. That's the thing with Amazon, you know, never know when they're going to hit. So anyway, um, so when you get that change in liver function, it's going to change the timing on these circadian rhythms. And so your melatonin should be highest early in the evening. That may be getting thrown off. The liver uh, stores the blood, cleans the blood, uh, goes through all the products of or byproducts of your uh, ingestion of food during the day. And after a few hours, it switches over to burning that glycogen. And if you're having difficulty with the liver, right, which, again, you would during a flush because it's putting stress on it, then you may not be going into glycogen burning properly and you may be waking up. Another possibility is you may be uh, there's another change over that has to happen and you start uh, going from glycogen burning to beta oxidation burning of fat. And at any of those junctures, uh, it's possible for the blood sugar to get too low and wake you up. So I suspect that's what's happening. This may happen for a week or two after you finish the flush also. So try not to worry about it too much. Next question. Has the function of the appendix been determined by traditional medicine? They say it has no function, although it doesn't make sense that nature would do that. What functions does TCM give to the appendix? That's a great question and a great observation. Yeah, we didn't come with any extra parts. It's like if you, <laughs> if you buy something that you have to put together and you put together this object and you have extra parts, that's bad. Your package should not come with extra parts, right? And neither should you. And you do not, in fact, uh, for decades doctors yanked every set of tonsils they saw. I am 71 years old. Anybody born within a few years of not anyone, but almost everybody, unless your parents went to 
natural healers, chiropractors, et cetera. But if they went to medical doctors, the odds are overwhelmingly, if you're in my age range, that they just yanked out that your tonsils. Well, we now know that the tonsils are critically important organs. They're lymphoid tissue. They are important to your immune system. They uh, trap bacteria. They have a lot of beneficial function. Uh, gallbladders, the, the saying in Western medicine is, when in doubt, cut it out. The gallbladder is one of the most important organs in your body overall. It's just that you can live without it, right? You can't live without your heart. You can't live without your lungs. You can't live without your liver. You can live without your gallbladder, but that doesn't make it unimportant. People who have their gallbladders out suffer from many problems, often problems they're not even aware of. Okay. So. This is actually a picture from a colonoscopy coming up here, the tubes going in. But here is the ileocecal valve right here. This is the ileum, the very end of the small intestine where most of your digestion takes place. Then the products of digestion get dumped into the large intestine. At this point, they're very fluid, watery. Uh, one of the jobs of the large intestine is to pull the water out so that you don't poop out too much fluid, um, which historically was a really, really, really bad thing. Many of the most common lethal disease epidemics that swept through the world over the last few thousand years were diseases of diarrhea. And people actually died because they had diarrhea and lost all their fluids. So it's a real serious thing. And you see the appendix here is actually uh, fascinating. It comes up, makes this really sharp turn, right? This is right by the liver called the hepatic flexure. Then it comes up here and makes an even sharper turn. And this is an area where many people will have some discomfort. That's the splenic flexure. Comes down here and then it rises up and it comes down into the rectum. Well, over here, just below this ileocecal valve, right off the bottom of the large intestine is the appendix, okay? Right there. Now, one of the things to, that's important is it's below this junction. So the flow of the contents of the intestines are gonna come up and over and then up, and they don't so much fall back down toward the appendix. If they do, then you can get food particles or you can get a little piece of poop or bacteria uh, that can block the opening to the appendix. Um, my middle son had to have an emergency appendectomy. He was swimming with his brother and his brother kicked him over his appendix. Well, that caused swelling of the appendix, which shut down this hole, caused the tissue to get inflamed and caused him to have appendicitis which of course can be a medical emergency. So the appendix is made of lymphoid tissue. It assists in the production of immune elements. That's not spelled very well. It helps fight infection. And it's also, and this to me is the most important historically, it's kind of a backwater reservoir. Remember it's, all, it's out of the rapids. It's a backwater reservoir for beneficial bacteria to repopulate the intestines after a severe diarrheal disease. So if someone has one of those severe uh, diarrhea diseases, and there, there are many of them, um, it can completely wipe out, wipe out your microbiome, which is critical for almost every function of the body. So the, the appendix would be a storehouse of those bacteria so they can rapidly get back up into the intestine and repopulate you with beneficial bacteria. Now, one of the things I just wanted to throw in here is a lot of people have chronic inflammation in the appendix, and they're really unaware of what their symptoms mean. In fact, often they don't notice it until I press on their appendix, and they kind of levitate off the table, and then we'll go ahead uh, and treat them with Chinese medicine, which is very effective for early stage, chronic, and for mild appendicitis. Very effective. Okay. So let's whip through these. I don't want to keep you all day. Foot and ankle injuries. Now, this is one I could easily do a week on. 
Uh, the question is, on your old radio show, you spoke of your ankle slash foot injury. You were told it would require surgery. You got electroacupuncture and the tissue was healed. I recall that you talked about damaged tissue fiber being crisscrossed as opposed to parallel. Would you please discuss the healing process? I sprained, supinated um, my ankle 20 years ago, and now it's incre increasingly difficult to walk. Now, I didn't put together enough slides on this because I, I really could have done 100. One of the things that's different about the Chinese medical approach and the approach that many really good Western doctors are starting to do, I know doctors at Stanford are doing this, you know, the old mnemonic was rest, right? Rest, elevation, ice, and rice, rice, rice. what I say? Rice. <laughs> Rice. No wonder it didn't work. Compression, right? And elevation. So I guess I'm hungry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I think so. So rice. Um, the problem with that is the ice part. Uh, ice can be used for a very, very short period of time to stop swelling. And some people disagree on that, uh, to stop swelling and to keep tissues from being further damaged. But that should only be done for a very short period of time, at most 12 to 24 hours. After that point, the damage has been basically done, right? The bleeding will have stopped. So, you, you know, the you don't need the ice to stop the bleeding. And at that point, further ice will congeal the fluids in the area. And that's a major cause of severe scarring in the area. So, for example, in Chinese medicine, it, actually, our treatments can be very painful for a sprained ankle because we will immediately get in and start massaging the joint. And really, the massage is to push the fluids out of the affected area. We, we want to get that fluid out because if the fluid stays there, it will eventually dry up, right? It'll dry up. And that fluid is carrying a host of minerals, including calcium. And so what happens as the fluid dries up or as the ice keeps it from moving, you'll get calcium deposits. And the calcium gets deposited in the scar tissue, making very, very weak scar tissue. Uh, in the Western world, uh, historically, once someone got a bad ankle sprain, they just kept spraining it. Thank God I've never sprained an ankle. I've twisted it a few times and I took action and I was fine immediately, but I have never knock on wood sprain, you know, had a severe ankle sprain. But I know people that are in the doctor's office every year for ankle sprains. And um, that's because it was initially treated inappropriately. So typically in a Western clinic, you get a three phase program. Rest, I'm all for that, protecting the ankle and reducing the swelling. So the ice and the elevation are to reduce the swelling. Number two, you're going to start restoring range of motion, strength, and flexibility. And those two pieces are very important. You really need to uh, clean up that ankle joint as soon as you can. And again, we use um, heat, electroacupuncture, and um, uh, herbal poultices or other uh, forms of topical treatment on there. And then we do wanna restore the range of motion, strength and flexibility. And then phase three will include maintenance exercise and then a slow gradual return to activities that don't require twisting of the ankle. And then later to do uh, more extreme activities. So Steph Curry is really starting in this phase three. They expect him to be ready by the playoffs. And with the quality of treatment that he gets, that's probably going to happen. Okay, this is a typical muscle structure. So you've got bone here. You've got the this white tissue uh, is a tendon that is linking. You know, that's the connection. Uh, a tendon connects muscle to bone. And then you're going to get some fascia around here. I'm not going to go into all the details. And then you get the muscle fiber bundle, which is made up of fibrils and myofibrils. And so when muscle contracts, uh, those get drawn toward each other 
and contract. And when you want it to relax, uh, the muscle, the nerve impulse changes and it releases. And when you get a muscle spasm, for example, it's because these are going into contraction and they're not relaxing. And that's where electroacupuncture is so very effective for muscle strain. Um, and also my wife does some very quick techniques. She'll put a needle in what's called the um, motor point. And the motor point is where the nerve enters the muscle. And so she'll needle precisely into that area, stimulate it once or twice with a little hand stimulator, and that will cause the muscle to release. It's actually pretty astonishing to see. Now, a tendon structure is very interesting. So any of you, there's a place where you can look at the, um, I was going to say tendon, but the cable on the Golden Gate Bridge. And it looks almost identical to this. So you've got this little tiny, these little tiny bunches of cables. And where you see these little bunches, that's made up of even smaller bunches of cables, right? So they're like the size of a thread. And those build up to a certain point, and then they join with these other fibers, which then join with other fibers, and then they're wrapped like this, exactly like the cable on a bridge. And so what you're really coming down to isn't this just this huge mass, it's these individual fibers. And I don't have a good picture here, I apologize, um, but there are good pictures out there showing that these fibers get cross-linked. So they should be straight. They should be in their own little bundles. And if you get overworked, you'll get some, you know, little crossover here. But that's why cats stretch and dogs stretch and hopefully you stretch when you get up because it breaks down those little bundles of scar tissue. And so very, very critical process. But in an injury, you get cross-fibering. And fibers from this group may cross over and link with fibers from this group. So they're running in the wrong direction. So when you get um, the tendon, when you get a contraction, it's actually contracting in the wrong direction. And so the job that we need to do is straighten out these fibrils. There are many things that can help with that. Um, there are injection therapies that help. Massage therapy can help tremendously. Uh, we do something called gua sha, where we're running something along the tendon. We do cupping therapies to pull the dead blood to the surface to make the healing better. But the number one thing, and this is really well proven, and there are good studies out there, uh, show that the single most effective thing for healing tendons and getting this cross linkage to dissolve and resolve is electroacupuncture. It specifically does that. And they found that there's a many, any number, at least 15 different chemicals that are released at the site of the electroacupuncture. So you get more red blood cells, you get more white blood cells. One of the biggies is adenosine. That's an amazing healing molecule. And you can get 25 times increase in adenosine from doing electroacupuncture. But there are all sorts of other chemicals that are released there that really speed the healing. So here, arthrofibrosis is generally what we're, we're talking about. And you, it's hard to see if you're not really familiar with, but here's early stage. You can see this big buildup of tissue here, right? Here's, this is coming down in front. This should be relatively flat but there's this big lump here. And then you see more and more of this white tissue that is being developed, right? That's fibrotic tissue. That has to go away. Now you can surgically do it. You can go in and cut it away. But what happens when you go in and cut? You're probably going to produce more fibrotic tissue from the cutting, right? So that's why I see that as a last resort. Sometimes it's necessary, but I would certainly prefer to do something less invasive. Okay, so that, oh, here's some electroacupuncture for muscle and tend tendon injuries. Uh, in, in about four minutes, I pulled all these up. Uh, central nervous system dependent release of mesenchymal stem cells. I mean, y'all know stem cells are the big thing, right? You, I mean, 
people getting stem cells in the heart get about an 80% reduction in cardiovascular events. Stem cells are magic, magic, magic. And you use your, you can use your own stem cells, uh, but you, you can get them from horses or any number of things. Uh, Catherine uses apple. Uh, apple. She uses stem cells from apples, which are amazing uh, for her facial rejuvenation treatments. And it's astonishing when you do um, micro needling, dermal needling, and with a with one of those, it, it it's amazing the difference for people um, with the stems with the apple stem cells. Yes. Yeah. Uh, electroacupuncture increases the concentration and organization of collagen in a tendon healing model in rats. You know, I, I'm not big on animal studies, but this is perfectly valid for tendon healing. So, organization of collagen. Effective electroacupuncture stimulation on long-term recovery following Achilles tendon rupture. And by the way, I, I didn't print all these or put them on here, but they're all very positive studies. Um, here we go. Electroacupuncture alleviates inflammation pain via adenosine suppression and its mediated substance P expression. Now, I said sometimes we want to increase the adenosine, but that can also increase pain. And so here we're looking at mediating substance P. P for, for uh, pain expression. And that actually happens in the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, I think I've got a... Uh, let, me, let me show you this. I have it in another section, but okay. Here's a picture. So when we do electroacupuncture lower on the body, the axons are carrying the pain messages. And what we do is we get the hypothalamus to release chemicals that inhib inhibit the paraaqueductal gray, which is where pain signals are sent out. So it literally blocks the pain signals in the brain. Fascinating dynamic. Okay. How soon postpartum can one start working on histamine intolerance issues? First, what are some symptoms? Headaches, migraines. You know, since I started paying more attention. I mean, I've known histamine was a problem for decades. I have a histamine problem, um, but I had, I really hadn't put enough attention on it for migraines. And now that I'm treating migraines that are um, not, there are dozens of different mechanisms for migraines, but if none of the other ones work, I'll go to histamines. And that often is the smoking gun, uh, nasal congestion, fatigue, hives, uh, you know, almost completely a histamine intolerance issue, digestive problems, irregular menstrual cycles. It's a huge issue. Nausea, vomiting, few symptoms. Here are some more. Flushing, rash, arrhythmias. Those are all histamine intolerance. Uh-oh, this didn't get blown up. Sorry. Um, I'll blow this up before we send it out to you. These are just some histamine-rich foods. Uh, I put it here because it's pretty, but you can go online and there are dozens of sites that will list histamine-dense or histamine-rich foods. Overwhelmingly, in my mind, uh, it's tomatoes. Now, there are lots of histamine-rich foods that if you're serious, you should stop eating them. Uh, but I find tomatoes are like throwing gasoline on a fire. Uh, they are very histamine dense and many people cannot talk. In fact, every summer I'll get five to six people during the course of the summer that come in with severe hives and they'll say, I've never gotten hives before. I don't know what happened. I say, hmm, you go out and eat a bunch of tomatoes. And, and invariably it's like, yeah, man, those cherry tomatoes are just so delicious. Yeah. And if you keep eating them, you're going to keep getting hives. Right. So it's a huge issue. Now, helpful additions to help break that down. Uh, the, I think the most important is a DAO, diamine oxidase. Um, it's a digestive enzyme that's produced in many organs of the body, but mostly in the intestinal lining, and it breaks down excess histamine in your body. Now, a certain amount of histamine, histamine is normal and necessary, but this will break down excess histamine in your body. Uh, quercetin is helpful. We have Chinese herbs that typically harmonize the yin and the way, right? So that you're not getting that inflammatory response. Um, 
N-acetylcysteine is helpful. I didn't put that on here. Um, again, uh, quercetin is really valuable. What do we have in dehis? Bromelain. Stinging nettles. Stinging nettles. Those are, those are vitamin all. Vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin C for sure. Those are all very, very helpful to reduce histamine loads. And I find that if people will be reasonably, reasonably responsible about not eating histamine rich foods and do diamine oxidase uh, within 15 minutes of their meal and do, we have a product called um, Dehist, which is, we use more for seasonal type allergies, but it's also effective for this. And then maybe some Chinese herbs that we can keep the histamine problem in check. Um, now, studies clearly show that DAO is helpful for this, but here's the answer to the questions. They really aren't enough studies yet on pregnancy and breastfeeding. Personally, I can see no reason for it to be a problem. And if one is not breastfeeding or pregnant, absolutely can start anytime. Uh, in terms of breastfeeding, I cannot make up a story where it would be a problem, but I have not seen research to support that. Concussions. Uh, what good? What's good for a concussion? A friend of mine has a really bad one. Well, the important thing is to take it more seriously than your doctor does, to take it more seriously than people have traditionally taken it. I played football and soccer. I got my, quote, bell rung, uh, unconscious, playing soccer. And I had my bell rung a couple times uh, playing football. It was not uncommon. So you'd come out, you'd wander to the sidelines. They'd say, uh, you know, what day is it? And you go, Friday? And they go, close enough. Yeah, it's, it's right next to Saturday. And they'd send you right back into the game. Right? I mean, that was really it. Now, every team has uh, teams of people, of doctors to evaluate. And they actually have a non-team doctor that checks out every possible concussion um, every player that could possibly have a concussion. So the teams can't cheat that way anymore. Um, but even with that, I don't know how many last year, I know at least four times that the, I saw really intense, you know, my wife is the acupuncturist for the 49ers. So we have a standing date for, on Sundays to watch the football game. And I'd hear her groan and moan and, you know, come back in the room and watch a replay of some player just getting, you know, his head practically knocked off. They go to the sidelines. Ten minutes later, they're back in the game and they're told they don't have a concussion. The next time my wife goes in, guess what? They're in the concussion protocol. So the symptoms don't always show up strongly immediately. So in a concussion, the brain is smashing back and forth against the interior of the of the skull and it can get bruised it can get uh, all sorts of problems now they're always serious uh when they examined the brains of about i think it was 100 football players that donated their brains to science 99 of them had chronic traumatic encephalopathy which is a progressive brain condition it's caused by repeated blows to the head and concussions okay now most of the research shows that one concussion in the absence of other brain trauma has never been seen to cause CTE. But I have seen concussions linger for a very long time if they're not um, properly treated. The biggest problem is that athletes are returned to competition too quickly. Um, so treatment, rest, much must rest, must stay away from whatever activities cause the concussion. Um, not too much TV, not too much brain or eye activity. Uh, chiropractic treatment is often good. It's going to, you know, with that concussion, there's usually some displacement, uh, vertebral or otherwise. Um, one thing I didn't put here is um, craniosacral treatment, again, which works on the cranium and rebalances it with the sacrum. I love craniosacral treatments, uh, very gentle and can be very powerful acupuncture treatment, usually electroacupuncture. So my wife is also the acupuncturist for St. Mary's 
soccer, I mean, a rugby team. Uh, rugby players get massive numbers of concussions. Uh, my wife treats everything else, but when they come in with a concussion, they see me and I evaluate them. And at least half of the time when they are told they're ready to go back and play, when I do my evaluation, I suggest they not do it for a while because I can still see signs of the trauma and there are herbal treatments. There's, there's one treatment that is specifically for concussions. And I spelled that wrong. Tong she, po shui tong. Don't go buy it on your own. Anyway, you should get, you know, someone to prescribe it for whoever it is. This word is spelled incorrectly. It should be I A O uh, tong shao ho shui tong. So those are the best treatments I've seen. There are others. There are a variety of, um, treatments that are done by psych by psychologists that can be very, very helpful. Um, I find not so much immediately after the concussion, but during the recovery phase, I've found some things that are very, very important. If you want to send me an email or ask another question about that, I'll be happy to supply those. And again, here's that picture of the paraaqueductal gray. Do we have any um, questions? Um. I... Okay, I'll check in a minute. Now, remember, this last slide is probably the most important. It's just my opinion, right? This is the dude, my hero. Yeah, well, that's like, uh, it's just, your, you know, it's your opinion, man. So you just got half an hour of my opinions. Uh, take them for that. Take them as a place to start your research, not a place as a place to end your research. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Any chat? Any questions? No. Okay. Cool. I bored them to death. They all went home. Um, okay. Send us some questions. If you get them to us a day with by a day by Monday, I'll go ahead and put some slides together uh, that will make it easier to remember things. Otherwise, just send it in the chat, and we're happy to handle it. All right. Be happy. Be healthy. I'll be back next Tuesday.